Hello again, everybody. Welcome back to our um, insanely ambitious, overly ambitious lineup of Snake Patrick's Day live stream programming. Um, we are so excited to welcome you to panel two with snake scientists. And um, for this one, it's titled Snake Reproduction, Garter Snake Guts, and How to Make a Sexy Snake. And for this one, we are so pleased to welcome a trio of panelists um, who are going to be joining me on stage progressively. Here they come. There's the first one, there's the second, and there's the third. We have Erica, Eli, Ely. I should have asked you, I'm not a professional, you know what that this is. Ely. <laughs> Ely, Erica Ely, who um, compounding my mistake is actually the Academy's own curatorial assistant from the herpetology department. And um, you have had a passion for California reptiles and amphibians since childhood, and you are super garter snake focused at the moment. Welcome, thank you so much for being here. Uh, next up we have Ari Miller, hey Ari. Oh, you're muted. You can unmute. Everybody unmute. Hey, all. It's great to be here. Uh, you are a research fellow at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of Natural History and a PhD student at Washington University focused on understanding how evolutionary history relates to the origin of biological diversity. So pleased to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And third, we have Dr. Rocky Parker, assistant professor at James Madison University, where his research um, uses in vivo experimentation to address questions about how, snake, how snakes make and respond to sex pheromones, hence the how to make a snexy, snexy. Actually, snexy is better. <laughs> snexy is way better, snexy way snakes. better. <laughs> Portion of our title. Hi, Rocky, welcome. Hi, thanks so much. Um, so again, super excited viewers, you probably know the drill already, but you can ask our questions panelists at any time by leaving them, you can ask our questions, you can ask our panelists questions at any time I got there by leaving them in the comment section of Facebook or the chat box of YouTube. And um, we will loop back to ask them all at the end. Our overall format, we're gonna start with a trio of kind of flash science talks from each of our scientists so you can really get into their work and then yeah, wrap up with uh, some Q and A. So I'll go ahead and get us started. Um, Rocky and Ari, we will see you in just a minute. We're gonna start with Erica and we'll throw your slides up on screen. And Erica, Great. thank you so much for getting us started. We'll see you in a bit. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us on our Snake Patrick's Day. This is very exciting. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about is um, garter snake guts and how museum specimens help us understand what snakes eat. So just to tell you a little bit about myself um, before we get started, I, as Laurel mentioned, I've always loved um, reptiles and amphibians since a young age. There I am on the, the right, um, can't even pose for a picture. And that led me eventually um, to working on a master's program at the University of Nevada, Reno with Chris Feldman, where I looked at the gut contents of snakes, both in the wild and in museums. But today I'll just be talking about the um, museum specimens. And also as Laurel mentioned, I am the curatorial assistant at the California Academy of Sciences in the herpetology department. So here's just a sneak peek into our collections. Um, some of you may have seen uh, the collection manager, Lauren Scheinberg's presentation earlier today. That was great. Um, so you got a sneak peek in the collection. Um, if you haven't seen it, just to familiarize you, we have the sixth largest herpetological collection in the world with specimens that date back to the 1850s. So, and they're from pretty much all over the world. And these are accessible to researchers so they can study things, um, study these specimens over time and space and do comparative studies between taxa. Um, so why, why study feeding habits in general? Basically, um, a few things to think about is that it's really important to our understanding of ecology at an individual level, a population and community level. So you get insights on competition between species, um, niche partitioning, so where these individuals are spending their time or what they're eating and geographic variation in behavior. Um, so maybe they're doing different things in different places and interactions with other organisms. Um, 
We also can evaluate hypotheses about biological diversification and dynamics of biological systems and evolution. Also, it can guide uh, conservation efforts because if we know what these organisms are actually eating, um, if there's something that we want to, to help conserve or put aside land for an endangered species, it's really important to know what these things are eating because if there's no food there, they're probably not gonna um, thrive very well. Uh, and now why garter snakes? So um, I guess aside from garter snakes, snakes in general, their prey availability is limited by their gape. And their gape is basically how wide they can open their mouth. So um, one example, or for different feeding strategies, we have things that uh, constrict. And then we also have um, venomous snakes like this rattlesnake here that was found dead. Sorry if it's a little gory, but this snake was found dead after trying to ingest this uh, scoloporous lizard, uh, also known as a blue belly or a Western fence lizard. And you can see that this lizard is pretty much as big as a snake. So it was able, the snake was able to envenomate it and eat it which then ended up actually killing it. So this snake with its small looking head actually was able to ingest this whole lizard, but then that caused some harm probably to its internal organs, such as its lungs and its heart. Um, also for garter snakes, uh, it's relatively easy to obtain uh, stomach contents from live animals and museum speci specimens when those stomach contents are present. So keep in mind that these snakes don't necessarily eat every day. Um, they're ectotherms, so they get their warmth from the environment. And if it's really cold, they may not be able to ingest something um, quickly. And also there's sometimes they eat things like tadpoles and small frogs, which are um, digested pretty quickly. And so um, just keep that in mind as we're talking about this and I'll go go through that later. Um, here's a few pictures of a garter snake in the field uh, eating a trout. So again, you can see this is a pretty big fish and um, the head looks a lot smaller than how wide that fish is. But uh, with the use of their quadrate bone, they're able to open their mouth wider. Some people can say it's like they unhinge their jaw, which isn't really correct. They have a quadrate bone, which allows them to just open their jaw much wider than um, other organisms. And here it is. Uh, here's another snake, which was found on the shore. So if you're ever walking around the creeks or lakes, you might be able to see a garter snake um, eating a, a big old fish. So, also, these garter snakes are really well represented in museum collections. So we have specimens dating back to the 1890s and they're relatively common snakes. So we can, um, we can find a lot of them. Also, uh, exploring the feeding habits of these snakes helps with um, co-evolution studies. So two of the garter snakes that I'm going to talk about today are um, have co-evolved with these newts here that are native to um, the west coast of North America. And these newts have a tetrodotoxin, which is the same thing, the same toxin that's in puffer fish. Um, and if you or I were to try to ingest one of these newts, um, it would likely be lethal we, um, uh, so there have been a few cases where some college students on a dare ate a newt and the guy actually ended up dying. But two of these species of garter snakes um, can actually ingest these newts with minimal effects um, to them. So I'm gonna talk a bit about the study area and the species. Um, so the study area is the Sierra Nevada and uh, Lower Cascade mountain range in uh, California. So we have our first 
species, which again is um, is it not vulnerable to this new toxin. That's Thamnophis cauchi, the Sierra Nevada garter snake. And then we have Thamnophis elegans, the terrestrial garter snake, which is much more widespread. I should mention the Sierra Nevada garter snake is really just found in the Sierra Nevada mountain range, hence the name. The terrestrial garter snake is a bit more wide ranging. And Thamnophis sertalis, the common red-sided garter snake is um, the most widespread uh, up throughout North America. But as I said, we're just gonna focus in California and I apologize, this map is a little busy. Um, also, you'll notice that the color behind each of these snake pictures is correlated to the dots on the map. So those are the museum specimens that I was able to examine. And the gray shading in the background is just to give you an idea of their range. And so, um, but as I said, it's a bit busy, but you can see that uh, I was able to get a pretty widespread uh, area for these snakes. So what I did was I examined probably about 400 um, individual specimens of each Thamnophis species um, found in the study area for stomach contents. And museum specimens all have like a locality and a, cape and a collection date, at least for the ones that I examine. So you can see here, I am carefully trying to pull out uh, some stomach contents. It was very gracious. I was, I had a lot of gratitude for the museums that allowed me to do this because this is considered um, destructive sampling. Although I usually just did an incision in the stomach um, or in the stomach region. And after the first hundred snakes or so, I was pretty good at finding that stomach with um, little damage to the specimen. So uh, once I did find a prey item, I measured the uh, snake length, which is referred to um, as, or the snout vent length, which I'll refer to as um, SVL here throughout the presentation and the weight of the snake. Um, I also took head measurements, but I'm not gonna talk about that today. And uh, then for the identifiable prey, I took, I recorded their weight and length, and of course, tried to ID them um, to their species. So here we have an example um, of two snakes. So we have, um, well, we have the, the snake that was in the process of ingesting this trout. Um, this is actually was a really cool find because the snake was from uh, 1911 and it's kind of hard to tell, but what it has here is a yellow leg frog and yellow leg frogs. Um, there's a few different species. One is endangered um, and two are threatened. So this is just really cool because we can also document the prey. We know that this prey was eaten within the area that the snake was caught. So for uh, amphibians, uh, and this frog is actually very sensitive to what's called the chytrid fungus um, that's been affecting frogs um, throughout uh, the world pretty much. And um, so this is also a cool documentation of, okay, this frog was in this area, which they may now be extirpated from. And then here's a different, feeding strategy, as you see, these first two snakes had very large prey um, and a single prey item. But here, this last snake on the screen um, appeared to have eaten three fish, three smaller fish. So you can think about different strategies as, okay, they're going to eat one large item or they're going to maybe go for some easier prey, but eat multiple prey items. You can also see how um, difficult it sometimes is to identify the prey because it's highly, it can be very digested depending on how long it's been in the snake's stomach. So what do we find? Well, as I mentioned before, snakes don't necessarily eat every day. So we only found um, stomach contents from about 12% of the specimens examined. And again, that's identifiable stomach contents. 
sometimes you just find mush and it's very difficult to be able to identify that. Um, what else did we find? So as I mentioned before with the um, that last snake picture I showed you where sometimes they eat multiple prey items. So for the three species um, that we're looking at, you can see that Thamnophis calci, the Sierra Nevada garter snake, uh, more often took a single prey item um, and uh, Thamnophis sertalis more often took multiple prey items. So let's see how that um, pans out with the body size correlation. So um, on the bottom here, we have um, snout vet lengths, uh, log, log transformed. And then on the y-axis, we have um, the prey weight also log transformed. And you can see um, for specimens that had multiple prey items, they're indicated by the asterisks. And I just took the average of those multiple prey items. And you can see really interesting, just like we talked about before, the Sertalis takes more multiple prey items. So you can see there's not much of a correlation between the length of the snake and the prey weight. Whereas um, Thamnophis cauchi here in green and Thamnophis elegans, there is more of a correlation. And um, again, as we saw previously, they tend to take uh, a single prey item. So they're taking larger single prey items more often. And it looks like Sertalis is taking um, multiple prey items more often that are probably smaller. So what I also did was look at the functional groups. So this can also explain some things about um, what they're doing out there. So you can see, again, Thamnophis cauchi is taking a lot of fish. Um, and Thamnophis sertalis is taking a lot of um, amphibians. And this also included um, like metamorphed frogs. And so if you think about walking along a pond when all the tadpoles have started to metamorph, there's lots and lots of small frogs around. So um, that might be a strategy that the Sertalis uses. And for the elegans, you can see they're the only um, snake here that took reptiles and mammals. So I didn't find any evidence of um, reptiles or mammals in Cauchi and Sertalis, although they might eat them, we just haven't found it yet. Um, also at the bottom here, I have, again, the snout vent length, but I didn't find much of a change um, between the snake size and what they're eating. And then lastly, I did, um, sorry, this is a little small, but the I put these functional groups into a habitat habitat type. So um, this is where it's really interesting for this niche partitioning where um, the cauchi is taking a lot more aquatic prey. Uh, Sertalis here in red is taking a lot more semi-aquatic prey and the elegans seems to be taking a lot more terrestrial prey. So the aquatic we're thinking fish and amphibian larvae, things that are restricted to water. The semi-aquatic are gonna be more like the frogs that have to be near water, but um, can, uh, can get outside of water. So more at the edge of the pond. And then terrestrial, we think about things like the mammals and the lizards um, that don't necessarily need to be right next to water. Um, also, I'll just mention too, uh, since I mentioned the newts before, and I didn't say much more about that, um, I did not find a lot of newts in the stomach contents, actually. And I only really found the newts in the Thamnophis cauchi, um, which is uh, not vulnerable to the tetrodotoxin. Um, Thamnophis elegans does not have like the mutations to be able to ingest the newts. And Sertalis uh, does have the mutations to be able to ingest newts. So that might, um, this resistance might be something to do with seasonal changes. 
that I just didn't detect or um, maybe something evolutionary over time. So we're still exploring that. And I just wanna say thanks to California Academy of Sciences uh, in San Francisco Museum of Vertebrate Zoology in Berkeley, the Los Angeles County Museum and uh, University of Nevada, Reno, Reno for access to the specimens and my advisor, Chris Feldman at uh, UNR. Awesome, thank you, Erica. That is a lot of snake stomachs, 400. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo. I imagine that you were pretty good at that by the end. Um, yeah. Okay, we have some questions for you, but I, uh, as mentioned, we're going to save those to the end so that we can ask them all at once. So we'll say bye to you for now and welcome right. on to the um, screen, Ari Miller. Hey, Ari. Well, thanks. Yeah. Um, well, that was a great talk, Erica. That was, that was so fascinating. That's a, that's a really neat group of snakes. And uh, well, I want to just say, um, well, thanks for Laurel and uh, Raina and Christina for, for hosting this fabulous celebration of uh, snake biology. And um, I'm thrilled to be here today. Yeah, we're so glad to have you. Um, okay, we will throw you your slides and I'll get out of here and see you at the end. Thank you. Lovely, thanks. Um, so yeah, I'm really happy to be here today. I have some some neat research concerning Southeast Asian snakes that I'm I'm hoping to get you all excited about. And, and hopefully while uh, talking about that, I can I can do my best to, to really demonstrate why uh, you know, natural history museums such as the Calicat are, are just really so critical. So let's get started. So before we get into some snakes, just kind of a quick about me uh, before we get into some neat looking snakes. So I grew up in Maryland, uh, right on the outskirts of Washington, DC. So I was kind of a young naturalist and I spent a lot of time in Rock Creek Park, but I also spent quite a lot of time in the National Zoo and at the Smithsonian. And I've always been fascinated by tetrapod diversity and mostly lizards and snakes. And uh, you know, when I was in 17 in high school, I was fortunate to begin an internship at the Smithsonian working with herpetologist, Dr. George Zug. And uh, Dr. Zug's written a, a textbook on herpetology and he's studying, he studied reptiles and amphibians all over the world. So uh, it was really a dream come true to me. And I was, I was really fell in love with this opportunity to study jars of specimens from all over the world. Because in one hand, I hold a jar of amphibians from um, you know, the Southern Ecuador. And in another hand, I could hold um, a jar of snakes from Sub-Saharan Africa. So it was this really neat ability for, you know, to me to pretty much teleport anywhere in the world and, and just really see this diversity of snakes or, or frogs or lizards or, or whatever I was interested in. So here's George and I in front of a, a rather impressive uh, blue whale skull housed at the Smithsonian. And um, well, after my first summer working at the museum and seeing kind of all these incredible uh, uh, natural history specimens, I kind of came to realize that, you know, natural history museums are like the Smithsonian or, or Calicat or the Field Museum or, or Harvard's MC, MVZ or MCZ is they're kind of like biodiversity libraries. And, and what I mean by that is in the same way that a historian might go into a rare books collection and, and try and reconstruct history and tell a story or inform the present from those rare books, a naturalist or a biologist might go into a natural history collection and try and reconstruct the evolutionary past or history or inform the present using those specimens. So there's really a lot that we can learn from natural history collections. Now, the first research project I did wasn't some sweeping synthesis of, of evolutionary theory and ecology, and it was kind of more fundamental biology work on snakes, and, and more specifically on a fascinating species of snake from Southeast Asia, from the, from the poorly known family called Lamprophiidae. And this species is called Samodynastes pulverulentis, and they're commonly known as moth vipers. And they really earned that name because of this stunningly impressive uh, mimicry of the viper snakes that they co-occur with. Now this project was essentially comprised of me leaving school early driving down the highway, going to the museum, and measuring snakes, and counting scales, and taking x-rays. I mean, it was pretty much like a dream to me. And trying to answer some really fundamental questions about the biology of these animals. What do they eat? How big do they get? Um, are males and females the same size? Some really fundamental questions about these animals that we can answer using natural history collections. You know, uh, every specimen in these natural history collections kind of has a story. So someone or a team of people went out and surveyed a forest or a desert, or, or a tropical jungle or something, and they brung these specimens back. So every animal has a story. And after working in the, in the bench and in this molecular lab and, and uh, with these specimens for, for a few years, well, I became really eager to take on this role as a field biologist and, and kind of, you know, this fundamental role of going out in nature and observing animals in the wild and documenting their behavior. So that's kind of exactly what I was looking to do. And, you know, I've been working with these animals from Southeast Asia, specifically amphibians and reptiles for quite some time in the collection. So I'd kind of become familiar with, okay, well, what are their diversity? What is the distribution of these animals? Now, my mentors at the Smithsonian worked in Myanmar, which is kind of on the Western extent of Southeast Asia, 
but I was really interested in the animals that occurred in Northern Vietnam. Now, one thing you'll notice about this map is that Asia is very topographically complex. That is, there's low-lying river deltas, there's highland plateaus, there's tall mountains at the foothills of the Himalayas. And often, with this geological complexity, we often find quite a bit of biodiversity. Now, I'd be especially interested in the animals that occurred in Northern Vietnam because of these karst mountains. Now, that is, these are these fossilized coral reefs that have been pushed up above the surface, above the ocean, over millions of years. And now they house animals that are only found there, and we call those endemic species. Now, endemic species mean that you can only find them sometimes on these single karst mountains, nowhere else in the world. And that was fascinating to me. And we know they harbor an extraordinary amount of diversity. So that was super interesting, interesting to me. And furthermore, we also know that Vietnam has seen a really exponential rise in the number of species of amphibians and reptiles within the last 30 years or so. In the 90s, we knew that there are about 300 species of amphibians and reptiles, and now we think that there's over 600. So there's been quite this increase, and well, I wanted to go see that for myself, and, and luckily, I had some great colleagues, and we were all interested in snakes. Now, if you're interested in snakes, Vietnam might just be a good place to go. So here's an evolutionary or phylogenetic tree of, of lizards and snakes, and uh, they form a clade together called squamata. And uh, this was generated using genome scale data. So that's millions of base pairs across the genome. And I put a blue circle next to the lineages or families that occur in Vietnam. Well, what we can gain from this phylogeny is that well, animals across a really wide evolutionary breadth occur in Vietnam. So if we're interested in sampling animals from widely across the evolutionary tree or the snake tree of life, then Vietnam is a good place to go do that because we can find pythons and uh, rat snakes and cobras. So my advisor once said, well, if you're going to work on islands, then they may as well be nice. And indeed, I think I took that to heart because, well, we were able to work on some really nice islands. So in 2019, we planned some field work there for about two months. And I had some excellent colleagues. And uh, well, we planned some of this field work in Ha Long Bay, which is a UNESCO uh, World Heritage Site. And there's these massive karstic mountains that arise out of the water in Halong Bay. And they're home to some really neat animals that are only found there, like these tiger geckos, for example. Now, uh, it's really nothing short of uh, uh, breathtaking when you're out there. And we started finding a few snakes. One of the first snakes we found, believe it or not, was an Asian mock viper. That's right. The same species that I drove down the highway to almost every day in high school to go see in a museum jar. So that was really neat for me. It was kind of this full circle moment and, uh, but that was really merely kind of just the beginning of the trip. And there was quite a bit more diversity to see. Another thing that we can't see by just, you know, measuring specimens in a museum is the behavior of these animals sometimes. So it's really too hot to go out during the day. So we need to survey for animals at night. And that's when the coolest species come out, by the way, sometimes. So, you know, this reason uh, that we need to survey and, and fund basic biological research is that we can go see cool behaviors like this one in the wild. So this is a brown spotted pit viper. It's one of the most common snakes in Vietnam. And we had no idea that this species actually guards its eggs. This is behavior that's been known among uh, pit vipers. And actually Dr. Harry Green, who spoke a little bit earlier today has uh, studied this quite a bit, but no one's ever knew that this species actually guards its eggs from predators. So that's a really neat observation that we're only able to make by actually going out in the wild and observing these animals in nature. But I was kind of more interested in, well, you know, the coasts are nice to sample, but what's in the mountains? What's in these really pristine forests in the more montane regions of the country? So for the last leg of the field work, we were in Hazan province, which abuts China. So this is Yunnan, China, and it's right near the border pretty much. We had seen some cool things. We had seen rhino nose rat snakes. We had seen horned vipers. We had seen the wild lorises, which are a type of endangered primate. We were trying to discover you know, something new. And uh, here's our uh, gorgeous field accommodations. We have, um, this is actually a Langer research station. So Langers are an endangered species of primate, a group of primates that occur in Vietnam. Um, and, and they specialize on these karstic mountains. And uh, we had a, a, a gorgeous porch, uh, as, as you can see here, uh, with a lumbly, with a, uh, it was uh, bamboo and, and stilted and kept us uh, high above the friendly leeches that were uh, certainly waiting us below. And uh, one thing you might notice is that these higher elevation er uh, areas are really quite forested. So there's still this intact montane forest. Now, if you go down to the lowlands, actually, it's not quite the same. There's quite a bit of agricultural development in these areas. And, and these are rice paddies. And, and the forest around here has been completely cleared. But there is still some conserved secondary forest on the outskirts. Now, on the very last night of field, we were really tired from working in the mountains. We had just about had it with the leeches. And we came down from the mountain to the lowlands to survey a waterfall area. Now, 
on the way driving out to this waterfall area on a road not too different than this one, but a little bit more forested, we came upon a small snake, one that could probably fit in the palm of your hand. Now, we thought, okay, this is a pretty interesting snake and it's pretty weird. And I don't mean weird and just, you know, well, it's a weird looking snake, you know what it is, but it's actually literally weird. So it's part of this family called Xenodermity. Now, Xenos in Latin means stranger or odd and, and derma, you know, ref refers to the skin. And uh, so this is an odd scaled snake. And there's only five different genera in this family in whole. So it's not very speciose. And most are poorly known. Uh, you might recognize one, it's called the dragon snake. Uh, it's from Sundaland and it's very weird looking, but this was a fascinating specimen. And uh, one thing you might notice is that it has a spectacular iridescence. And iridescence is found pretty widely across snakes uh, in the rainbow boa, for example. Um, but it's really striking to see nonetheless always. And uh, well, based on the anatomy and morphology, we were able to determine that this is a, a member of the genus called Acalinus, which is not a super specious group. There's only 15 or so species and it's only found in Japan, China, and Vietnam. Now, we noticed that this species had a very unique scale counts and measurements. Now, what that means is that when we took this animal back to the Smithsonian, we put it on the table and we're saying, okay, what do the scale counts look like on its face? How many scales does it have on the tail area? So we're taking all these different morphological traits and anatomical traits and trying to ascertain, well, how different or similar is it to the other taxa in this genus? Well, we know that it's actually quite different. When we took a snippet of its DNA and we sequenced some DNA, we noticed and we placed it in an evolutionary tree that, hey, this occupies a branch that's pretty divergent from all other Acalina species. Well, that's pretty neat. Furthermore, it's very genetically divergent when we sequence some of its mitochondrial DNA. So given kind of these integrative lines of evidence, we can hypothesize that, hey, we've discovered something unknown to science, a new species. And we named this new species Acalina sigorum, which uh, honors uh, Dr. George Zug and his wife, who was in that uh, earlier picture at the beginning, uh, for some of their great contributions they made to uh, the study of herpetology and also uh, the mentorship of many folks in the field. So now, now the hard thing is that, how do we learn more about the snake? Well, it turns out that Acalina snakes and odd snakes in general are really quite difficult to see. So in about 25 years of surveying reptiles and amphibians in northern Vietnam, my colleague has only seen about six or so odd scaled snakes. So, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not easy to find. And uh, when it comes to field biology, there's quite a bit of luck and serendipity involved, uh, someone might tell you. So now we kind of have to do, uh, uh, do some biological sleuthing in a way and kind of be uh, detectives to kind of figure out, well, what is the ecology of this animal and how does it behave and how does it live if we can't actually observe it in the wild all that often? Well, we know a few things. So for example, in a study in the 80s, we found that acalina snakes have really reduced brain areas that are associated with vision. Furthermore, acalina snakes only have rods in their retinas. Now we know that humans have both rods and cones, so we can see well during the day diurnally, and we can see, you know, during semi-low light conditions. Acalinas can't really see that well at all during high light conditions. So they really have poor visual acuity. We can use these data to infer that, hey, these are probably fossil snakes. That is that they're burrowing and they spend a lot of time underground. Well, that would make sense given some other lines of evidence that we see here. For example, we know that acalina snakes eat earthworms. It's been reported a few times and we can use some of this dental morphology that is looking at the teeth and seeing these micro wares on the teeth to understand what are these animals eating. So luckily we can use some of these morphological features to do some predictive analyses of the behavior and ecology of these animals. So in, in, just to wrap up here and, and to kind of uh, think of the bigger picture here. So in conclusion, you know, why does it matter? Why does it matter that we found a new species of odd scaled snake in, in, in some mountain in Vietnam? Well, uh, I, I think it kind of fits into this broader importance of appreciating biodiversity. And, and for me, it's understanding, you know, the principles of, of evolution and ecology, but also kind of, uh, you know, appreciating the fact that, you know, humans are part of this global ecosystem and so are odd scaled snakes. And, and it really is a delicate balance uh, as is depicted here in this uh, very neat illustration from Cuc Vuong National Park in uh, Northern Vietnam. So, you know, if we protect odd skilled snakes and we protect the forest, then, you know, we're protecting the people who depend on the forest. We're, you know, stopping the spread of infectious diseases. We're, we're upholding economies. We're, we're, we're uh, you know, preventing crop deterioration. So, uh, you know, we need biological diversity just as much uh, as, as, uh, as, as it fascinates me at least. Um, um, so, if we know how many species are out there, we know where they occur, we can uh, do our best to focus resources and, and, and uh, on conserving diversity. So um, I think that's my time. 
And uh, well, I'm happy to answer any questions at the end of the panel. And uh, well, thanks for listening. Ari, thank you so much. I'm so delighted to even know that odd, sna odd, scale odd scaled snakes exist, which I didn't prior to this talk. Thank you. Um, Hillary also should just a question. Um, are they are they venomous? I don't think that's I don't know that that's something you mentioned, but a couple people were curious. They are not venomous. No. Okay. All right. Perfect. That was an easy one to answer. And I have yep. more substantive yep. ones for you that part. we will. Okay. Yep. <laughs> we'll save the substantive ones. We'll see you in just a few minutes. Thank you so much. Lovely. And um, we will welcome Rocky to the screen. Hey, thank you so much for wearing a tie for this. I really appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> Well, it's a little bit of a joke because um, it is St. Patrick's Day or St. Patrick's Day, so I'm kind of playing with the green thing. Um, anyway, uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Rocky Parker. I'm an assistant professor at James Madison University in the Department of Biology. Um, I use he, him pronouns, and I'm also uh, openly cisgender uh, gay man. Um, and I also work a lot on DEI efforts, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, because I think this is a pressing issue um, to address in higher education where all of the speakers are coming from, different positions in higher education. And so I just wanna bring that uh, to the forefront because I think it's crucial. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk about um, a lot of the work that my lab focuses on here at JMU, where we use hormone manipulations to change the ways that snakes actually present themselves to conspecifics. Um, and I'll be using garter snakes as the model for understanding this. I just wanna also acknowledge the other speakers in the session and also the ones who came in the first session, um, as well as the invitation to come and talk about this. Anytime I get to talk about snakes and geek out among my peers, I'm down. It's like super fun. Um, okay. So I am fascinated, um, if not just completely enamored with sexual signals. They come in a variety of forms and I'm especially uh, fixated on cryptic forms of communication in animals, um, especially vertebrates, such as electric waveforms in fish, um, and then sex pheromones in lots of different species, which we would just generally call chemical signals that allow for sexual dimorphism to uh, exist within a species or create sexual dimorphism, and therefore allow for sex discrimination um, among potential mates. Um, I love snakes uh, because whenever we think about their reproduction, um, they do it in some really weird ways. Um, for example, we have, you know, uh, different types of gopher snakes and bull snakes that do this sort of, uh, they grip the female by the neck whenever they mate, and that's part of their courtship ritual. And then we have lots of species of aquatic snakes that can sense sex pheromones on potential mates because these pheromones tend to be lipids that don't diffuse out into the water. They stay on the surface of the snake's skin, which enable them to be really effective signals for allowing mate assessment. Um, so anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm super fascinated by snakes and the ways that they have sex. Now, I have to acknowledge that there have been some really spectacular field sites, but nothing's quite as hot to me as a limestone rock quarry, um, which you're seeing here. This is our field site in um, Inwood, Manitoba, Canada. Um, where right now the snakes have not come out yet um, during the spring breeding season. And the reason this is spectacular to me as someone that studies animal behavior um, and chemical signaling, it transforms into this over a matter of days where you have hundreds of snakes that have emerged from the ground after they've undergone long-term winter dormancy of about eight months, total darkness, four degrees Celsius, if not colder for a long period of time. And then as the ground starts to warm up, they immediately switch to being interested only in mating and therefore reproduction. Also side note, all of the snakes that you see in this image are males. So I'm now going to show you another major benefit to studying these animals in Manitoba, which is sample size. Um, so here's my PhD advisor in a vintage clip from the Mason lab, where he's taking this giant basking pile of male garter snakes. And he's just showing you that density is one of the reasons that we are um, sort of adamant about studying the snakes here, where we can get them in these large numbers and therefore run lots of really complex experiments without running the risk of running out of animals in these experiments. And I don't mean terminal experiments, though we do conduct terminal experiments. I'm talking about behavior experiments where we have to move animals from one treatment to another, or maybe an experiment doesn't work. We can release those snakes, get new snakes, etc. The snakes will stay at the den for about four to six weeks, um, especially the males. Meanwhile, the females come up, they'll usually mate one 
once, maybe twice, and then they disperse, well, whereas the males linger. And that's why it looks like the sex ratio is really skewed here, but it's actually not um, in terms of the entire population. It's a 50-50 split between males and females. Um, okay. So this is what I call snake eye view, right? So imagine being a male garter snake, you just emerged from hibernation, and now you're looking around for mates, right? Where are the females? Um, all of these males are rapidly searching the environment. And what they're doing is they aren't using visual cues to make uh, to identify a female. They're relying only on chemical cues to make that mate decision. Um, is this a female? Yes or no. Is she of high enough quality to exert courtship effort uh, toward? Yes or no. Um, and the older a male gets, uh, the better he is at assessing the quality of a female through her sex pheromones on her skin. So this leads to some really spectacular examples of sexual selection. For example, here is a male uh, garter snake on top of a large female who's also surrounded by about 15 to 20 males that you can't really see most of them, but you can see their heads because these males are staying juxtaposed immediately to the female so that they can tongue flick rapidly on her body and stay in constant chemical contact with her. Here she is, here she is, here she is. That's what they're doing the entire time that they're using their tongues to assess the female sex pheromone. Um, also, uh, males show a really awesome mate guarding tool called uh, the copulatory plug. So here what you're looking at is a female's cloaca. Um, so this would be toward the tail, toward the head. And the cloaca is distended because it has a giant gelatinous mass that's deposited in it um, that the male makes after he's done copulating. So at the very end, he will deposit this copulatory plug. This is very common in nature scene snakes, uh, but not so much in all snakes. And what's really cool here is this is a rare example of a double mating plug. So this female actually had intermission from two males at the same time who each deposited their own copulatory plug. Chris Friesen has done some remarkable work on uh, the post-copulatory sexual selection mechanisms in the garter snakes, um, focusing on males, sperm, and then how females assess the quality quality of a male, and also what happens once the sperm slowly dissolve out of the copulatory plug, it acts sort of like a spermatophore and will slowly deliver sperm to the female over time. Um, so Chris looks at all of those different facets and his work is just really, really beautiful. Um, I'm particularly fascinated by the snakes because of their behaviors. So here what you're looking at is a mating ball of garter snakes. So here's the female and she's surrounded by males who are all actively trying to mate with her. Um, and essentially she'll move in this kind of circular pattern and is responding to some tactile cues from the male, but we really don't know what the major factors are that determine female receptivity besides sex hormones. We know that sex hormones dictate this. Um, but what's fascinating about these mating aggregations is that they're phylogenetically widespread. So other nature scenes show this, such as water snakes, and even in more evolutionarily ancient groups of snakes, such as Burmese pythons in the Florida Everglades and uh, anacondas in Brazil, you can see these mating aggregations form during the breeding season. So what I want to emphasize here is a major misconception a lot of people have about um, pheromones and how males respond to them in general. The male's nervous system in any vertebrate spirit, uh, in any vertebrate species that uh, uses sex pheromones to make mate decisions, changes dynamically uh, over the season. So a male's uh, vomeronasal organ where he senses the pheromone. It's like a second nose for the male. This VNO changes dynamically across the year to only express receptors for female sex pheromone during the breeding season. And then they don't have use for this outside the breeding season, so it goes away uh, and it'll come back every year. Females, however, constantly produce some amount of female sex pheromone. So it's not so much that females go from unattractive to attractive. I'm going to put some nuance in there in a second. Instead, it's more so that male senses to detect female sex pheromones are dynamically changing across the breeding season. Is that true for all snakes? I have no idea. The longer that I study snakes, the more I realize we can't really make generalizations beyond our own species or possibly um, the most closely related species. Um, okay. So garter snakes are really interesting uh, among snakes because they really live two different lives, especially the more temperate a population of garter snakes is. So for example, in Manitoba, these snakes have a truncated breeding season that's very, very short. And then they have a limited amount of time to forage females to have their babies, and then time to migrate back to the den where they will then undergo a long period of winter dormancy because that is the only way they can survive these freezing uh, above ground temperatures or surface temperatures. Um, so this is what the annual time budget looks like for a snake, uh, for a garter snake in Manitoba. 
my lab is now really starting to pursue some questions about what this means for social versus asocial periods of the snake's life every year. Um, during the mating season, they're obviously social. They aggregate and they try to mate with females. Um, and females are making some types of uh, male assessments. But during the rest of the year, um, at least during the active period of the year, they're remarkably asocial. They don't like being in the same places. And if anything, other snakes are their competitors for food. Um, so we're really thinking about what this means to go from a social uh, sort of interactive uh, period of your life to an asocial period um, and what that can mean for transmission of lots of different things. So now on to garter snake sex pheromones. I'm sure that people want to know about this and what these things are. It's really, really interesting. It involves some chemistry, but not enough to scare you away, hopefully. So here's a really great example that Don Powers uh, took, a picture that Don Powers took of a, a smaller than average male and a pretty honking big female. And this male thinks that he's like won the lottery, right? Like this is like the big mamma jamma, right? Um, and so there's obvious size dimorphism, but there is also sexual signal dimorphism at the level of the sex pheromone that is present in the species. So mate recognition in the garter snakes depends on the female sex pheromone. Um, the female sex pheromone is a mix of long chain methyl ketones. So what does that mean? Essentially, these are long chains of carbon that have a methyl ketone group at one end. Um, and those methyl ketones can either be saturated or unsaturated, meaning that they can have a double bond in one part of the chain or not. Those unsaturated components in, the in these methyl ketones provide the attractivity signal. This is what makes a female come across as attractive to a male, and we know that through a lot of experiment experimental evidence. Um, we can isolate the pheromone really easily. Uh, my lab recently published a methods paper that really d demonstrates the sort of flow through, but here's a schematic just to show you how we actually uh, isolate the lipids and then use specific analytical processes to be able to split them apart into compounds we can analyze. So we might take a sample. So let's imagine we take a swab that has hexane in it and we can rub it along the skin of the female and it will just remove the lipids from her skin. Those lipids get replenished immediately, so it really causes no ill effect to the female. We can then take that swab and extract the lipids from the swab using hexane again, and then we can place that onto a chromatography column. For those of you that don't know anything about this, it doesn't really matter. The point is we can split up the pool of compounds into specific subcomponents um, of that pooled lipid mixture. And then we can analyze each of those fractions for specific compounds labeled here as retention times. Why does that matter? Because we can purify just the sex pheromone and we can put that down in the den and we can watch males respond to it. We know that we can isolate this sexual signal. So there is chemical sexual dimorphism in our system. Males produce little to any methyl ketones and the methyl ketones they do produce tend to be very uh, saturated rather than unsaturated. So they don't get courted in the field if they have a normal male skin lipid profile. Females, however, look very different. Each one of these peaks that you can see represents a specific methyl ketone of a specific length. As you go from left to right on the x-axis, whenever I show you one of these, those compounds get longer and therefore heavier. Um, the unshaded peaks, if you can zoom in and see that, are the unsaturated methyl ketones that make the female most attractive. So what I hope you can appreciate here is that this female has a pheromone profile that's dominated by unsaturated methyl ketones, and she's going to be really, really attractive. Um, those of you that are very chemistry oriented might have already said, well, yeah, but you're not really taking into account concentration. We use an external standard to be able to look at concentration of the pheromone profiles in addition to the qualitative nature of the pheromones that they produce. Um, so why, again, the garter snake system? You could probably do this in any snake, but why the garter snakes? Because during the breeding season, these snakes have no stress response. You can literally walk up to them, pick them up, and they will continue trying to mate. And I'll show you that now. This is, again, another vintage clip. So uh, Bob is going to be holding a female, and you're going to watch all of these males climb onto her and start to quarter, despite the fact that a human is there and holding this female. So here the male, first male starts to notice her, and then he'll start to chin rub on her body and, and align his body with hers despite the fact that a hand is right there. He tries to move the finger out of the way. I love that example. And then you'll see other males start to come onto the female as well. Uh, that's demonstrating what we call facilitated courtship. The more males that start to court a single female, the more intense those males' behavior becomes over time. Um, so they have facilitated courtship and it's predictable. We know that they're going to do this every year in the spring as they come out of the ground. That activation of male sex behavior 
is due to the fact that they were undergoing long temperature dormancy, low temperature dormancy for a long period of time that changes their brains and gets them ready for courtship and mating in the spring. Okay. So we know that there's this chemical dimorphism, right? Methyl ketones in females and basically nothing in males. Now, the question becomes, how much variation is there in females? We know that as females get longer, so from top to bottom, females get longer in body size, their methyl ketone composition changes dramatically. So the longer a female is, the more of these unsaturated methyl ketones she makes, and males respond with stronger courtship. So we know that this tracks with body size. That means that the sexual signal is a pretty reliable indicator of mate quality. But... One of the most interesting things that came out whenever I was doing my PhD work is that there is seasonal variation in the methyl ketone profiles. So the same females that go into fall look very, that go into hibernation in the fall, look very different by the time they come out in spring. So there is some role that low temperature dormancy plays in altering the composition of the skin lipids that are present on the females. Um, so how reliable of a signal is it? That's a really important question that um, we're also starting to address through hormone manipulation. So, okay, and this brings up the first group of studies that I have done. I'll show some pictures of students here and there because my lab runs on undergraduate effort and focus and intellect. Um, I really take pride in the fact that JMU is a primarily undergraduate focused institution, though we also have a master's program. So here what we do is we're using uh, hormone manipulation to alter the pheromones that males can produce. So on the previous slide, I mentioned that males don't really produce methyl ketones if the male is a normal male, right? But we can use hormone manipulation to alter the composition of the male's skin. Um, and this arises from the fact that we know from previous studies in lots of vertebrates that castration um, changes the production of, uh, sex, of sexual se uh, characteristics. For example, male roughs during the breeding season increase cir their circulating levels of testosterone and they'll grow these remarkable ornaments, right? So the presence of testosterone in the blood activates a male signal and the removal of that hormone, the testosterone, through gonadectomy or GX treatment, will return the male to the pre-breeding season plumage. So a male in the breeding season without testes will never develop uh, these secondary sexual characteristics that are important to reflect his quality. Um, the same is true in lots of other vertebrates, such as electric fish. So here what you're looking at is that um, with the treatment of, with the addition of androgens to uh, a male, he can become more male. He can actually change his EOD uh, characteristics, uh, which is the electric organ discharge that he makes and uses this as a sexual signal to attract mates. And in reptiles, we've known for a very long time that testosterone treatment and castration can alter skin-based sexual signals such as coloration. So here what you're looking at is a castrated male uh, of this scoloporous species ends up looking phenotypically like a female even during the breeding season because he lacks that circulating testosterone, so he can't produce a male typical signal. So here's how we do some of these studies. Um, we use celastic tubing packed with some type of crystallized steroid hormone. So what does that mean? We can take this sort of empty tube that you see here. It's just a long tube of plastic and we can pack it with crystallized uh, steroid hormone. Basically, we're making a small little tube, sealing it on both ends with silicone and the length of the implant determines the dosage. So for example, in this study, we used one length to represent the longest dosage or greatest dosage. And then we covered up part of the implant to, rel to create a medium-sized dose, and then three quarters of it with an impenetrable um, uh, cyanoacrylate um, glue so that it doesn't uh, allow for the steroid to pass across the plastic um, to create the smallest dose. So what I'm just trying to emphasize here is that we give them exogenous sources of hormones by putting the implant into the body cavity, sewing it back up, and then those snakes are now going to be hormonally different than controls that receive a blank implant. Um, we then bleed the snakes to validate that these hormone treatments work. And what I want you to appreciate here is in this study where we gave them different doses of estradiol through this methodology, we got differential circulating levels of estradiol in the bloodstream of these animals by the time we tested them in May. So what do I mean by this? We do these manipulations with field caught animals, but we do those manipulations back at the lab at JMU. So we go back and forth to Canada to collect snakes, do these manipulations, then we hibernate them in the lab. 
and then take them back to Canada for bioassays. So it's very, very labor intensive. And we do this because the bioassays that we use to determine how attractive an animals become through manipulation can really only take place in the field. You can do it in the lab and it works, but it's not the same as a lab-based bioassay. So this is the trek that my lab makes every year. Uh, JMU is right here and that's where I am currently. And this is the drive that we take every spring to take the animals up and do the bioassays, collect new animals and come back. So again, these mating balls that form in the den are a great uh, opportunity for running these kinds of experiments. And um, we use a lot of different assays to do this, such as a competition assay. And with this, we have a, a researcher hold an animal that's been manipulated and they hold it next to a female who has not been manipulated, obviously. And we can count how many males come onto that manipulated animal over time. And we can determine whether or not that experimental animal became attractive relative to controls. We found out through a lot of experimentation that estradiol makes males attractive. But the question is why? Why did those males become attractive and how? Um, we also do uh, some mating ball size tests. And with this one, what you do is uh, it's the same experimental approach, except that rather than having an animal placed in the den, uh, and then you actively remove the animals that are courting it, you allow the mating ball to form on its own for two minutes. And then you just assay how many, how many snakes, how many people, how many snakes are there at the end of the assay. And what I want you to see here is that we can get some discrimination among the dosage of estradiol making males more or less attractive. Um, also, this scales uh, with uh, dosage. So the more estradiol the males receive, the larger the mating balls become. Um, okay, and I'm going to finish by just talking about the changes in the pheromone profiles that we know exist once these animals have been treated with estradiol. Um, so here, what you're noticing is that uh, a male that's been sham treated has no expression of methyl ketones. A female, for reference, has these product the product produces um, unsaturated methyl ketones that are predominantly the larger version. When males are given estradiol, they become like super females. And so they produce lots of these largest unsaturated methyl ketones. And statistically, we can see that these are only, this is only happening for very specific compounds in the sex pheromone. And what this means is that estradiol has a very specific effect, this female sex pheromone, female sex hormone, a very specific effect on the production of uh, female sex pheromone in the garter snakes. We've also done these same experiments in a diverge, uh, uh, evolutionary divergent group, uh, brown tree snakes, um, in a more recent paper, and we saw the same effect. Males became attractive when they're treated with estradiol, they produce these long chain methyl ketones, and it's the same methyl ketones that go up in expression. So the question becomes, how deep in the snake phylogeny does this actually go, this estradiol specific effect? Um, okay, and with that, I'm just going to go ahead and finish with my title, my finishing slide, which is here. Um, oops, sorry, excuse me. And to say that pheromone production in snakes is regulated by reciprocal mechanisms of steroid hormone action. We know that estradiol makes males attractive and it's also responsible for female attractivity. Those are previous research experiments that uh, predated mine. But we also know that testosterone inhibits sex pheromone production. Whenever you castrate a male garter snake, he will also become attractive because he lacks the androgens that suppress his production of pheromones. So there appears to be this interesting dichotomy um, regulated by these sexually dimorphic hormones that circulate in the bloodstream that lead to this chemical signal dimorphism. Uh, and with that, I'll just thank the students who have provided so much uh, time and effort and intellectual uh, contribution to the work that I've done. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Um, thank you. That was that was super interesting. Did, the, did those particular pheromones show up in any non-snake species or are they just specific mm. to snakes? Yeah, so um, methyl ketones are really interesting. There's been some work with Scoloporus that's shown that um, uh, Jake Pruitt in Diana Hughes's lab uh, showed that methyl ketones are definitely um, present in the scent marks that Scoloporus use, but whether those are the principal cue that's used as a uh, sex pheromone is not really clear. Um, so the answer would probably be no. But what's interesting is that lots of deer, for some reason, have these methyl ketones that they produce in between their um, their hooves, their split hoof or whatever. Um, and those methyl ketones appear to be the product of microbial metabolism, and they're not actually made by the deer. Whether oh, or not wow. they function in sexual signaling, we don't know. Yeah, there's all kinds of interesting stuff now. So. Okay, cool. Um, well, great. We have more questions. Let's invite back our other panelists. 
and I'll ask everybody a handful. Um, hey, everybody, welcome back. Uh, so one question that we uh, got that I think is we can just we can go through and ask everybody. Um, Haley would like to know how often do snake researchers actually get bit? What's the, what's the real truth? <laughs> All the time. All the time. <laughs> I think it depends right, on the time of year, right? The time of year that you work with them, but. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we avoid getting bit by the venomous ones more often. Um, depends on where you work too, but yeah, I get pretty, bit pretty often. <laughs> yeah, Ari? Yeah, it, it, uh, it depends on your snake whisperer skills, I guess, to, to some <laughs> degree, right? But uh, yeah, the goal is to, to get bit as least as possible, but absolutely, you know, it's just uh, okay. part of the job. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's very, that sounds very professional. That seems like something we can all get behind. Don't get bit if you can avoid it. Don't get bit by venomous species and you're good. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. I'm going to run down the line because I have a couple for each of you. Um, so Erica, Danny asked, um, do garter snakes have to rest or behave differently while they're digesting something so much larger than them? Yeah. When snakes eat, snakes in general, when they eat a very large prey item, um, they will act differently or not maybe move around as much, um, like, and try to get it. I, what I've seen too is like, they'll try to be in a, a burrow or in an area where they can get some warmth to help digest that. But they definitely move a lot less when they uh, have eaten. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Ari, Tess asks, do forest snake versus lowland snakes have very different adaptations or do you tend to find the same species in both areas? That's a, that's a fantastic question. Uh, well, you know, in, in this case, we actually don't know, but we, we do know that, uh, you know, species adapt to local environments. We call that local adaptation. Um, and, and it's been documented widely across a, a wide breadth of, of evolutionary diversity. Um, in this case, uh, we don't quite know. Uh, we, you know, with odd scale snakes, we don't really know where they live that much. Uh, mm -hmm. We kind of have this really sparse distribution of, well, they're found here in, in northern Vietnam, and they're found 300 kilometers away in southern China. And we don't know what's happening between, uh, even less so in, in these kind of microhabitats on on one side of a hill, or you know, at the bottom of a valley, or at the top of a mountain. Um, but that's totally a fair expectation to expect that you know, with different habitats, there would be different adaptations in diet or um, ecology, or, or all these different facets of, of snake biology. Definitely. Great, thank you, uh, Rocky. Um, is there an advantage, so this is from Scott, is there an advantage for the male snakes in having that ability to sense sex pheromones actually go away for part of the year? Hmm. Yeah, um, I think that because the female sex pheromone changes for part of the year, I'm sure that that's useful to a degree, but the male sense, the male sort of system is downregulated outside the breeding season. And so a female could continue to be super attractive, but if no one's there to listen to it, you know what I mean? Then it's, it just falls on deaf ears in other words, or falls on, you know, people that aren't being able to pay attention to it right now. So, mm -hmm. yeah. But there wouldn't be an advantage necessarily in like in being unable to sense that for part of the year that doesn't confer anything particularly useful well, for the males? Yeah, so there's two answers there. The first is yes, obviously if you can focus in that brief period of time that you have to eat, like uh, that would definitely be adaptive. I see, yeah. But we know that from Deb Luderschmidt's research that uh, the males go through a very, the males and females go through a very significant neuroendocrine change when the breeding season starts to wane on. Their brains change, their stress system becomes active, and that signals dispersal. So okay. there's all kinds of fascinating neuroplasticity that's happening at the garter snakes. And if anybody's listening and thinks that's cool, look at Deb Luderschmidt's stuff. It's really, really cool. Okay, cool. Um, so back to Erica. Uh, this question's from Elena. And I think she's asking essentially whether you've seen the introduction of any invasive species affect garter snake um, diet behavior locally. Um, yeah, you know, there are some introduced uh, trout into the uh, Sierra Nevada. They stock those uh, lakes for um, for fishing. And I have found some introduced uh, fish in, uh, yeah, it's a really great question. I've found some introduced fish in uh, the summit contents. And also um, in the Central Valley, there's a lot of bullfrogs that have been uh, introduced and they're um, a very invasive species that uh, eats pretty much everything. Uh, they're large frogs. And um, there's also the giant garter snake that 
lives in the Central Valley. And so um, there have been reports of the giant garter snakes eating these bullfrogs, um, which have depleted a lot of their uh, natural prey. So okay. they're trying to get rid of the bullfrogs, but you don't want to get rid of all the bullfrogs because then right. they won't have food. So it's it's right. very complicated. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so Aria, I have two for you here. The first one is from Todd, and I don't actually I don't have um, a sense of the context behind this, but he asks, uh, why has the number of species in Vietnam nearly doubled? Does that make sense to you? Yep. Yeah, okay. yeah definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, you know, luckily there's some really fantastic biologists in Vietnam. Um, and, and they've really made a proactive effort over the last, uh, you know, 50 years or so to uh, go out in these forests and, and all types of habitats and survey and then bring these animals back into collections and do these really in-depth and time-consuming analyses to determine well, what's a new species and, you know, what's part of an already described species. So, um, you know, there's an absolute number of, of, of species that occur in Vietnam for amphibians and reptiles and, and snakes. Um, but we have yet to reach that plateau as there's a, it's a, such a diverse country. So there's just so much out there to, to be, ex, to be explored. But um, nonetheless, we know the reptiles are a, a globally threatened group that uh, uh, mm -hmm. require uh, targeted conservation efforts. Um, so that definitely needs to be uh, broadly appreciated more. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And this next question is from Eric. Um, he would like to know why iridescent shows up so often in snakes and whether it's functionally useful to them in some way. That's a fantastic question. Um, well, we know that uh, iridescence is kind of caused by what we call chromatophores and specifically uh, iridophores, which are these kind of iridescent cells in the skin of snakes. Um, we don't exactly know the function uh, in this case specifically, and it's, it's kind of uh, enigmatic in that, in that capacity. But we know it's found really widely and we know kind of the uh, cellular mechanistic basis, basic for it, basis for it, but uh, the functional basis is that's a little bit harder to unravel and, and tell that story. Okay, cool. I like a mystery. Um, Rocky two, last one's for you as well. Uh, let's see here. We have, I'm going to ask this one from Jade who asks, are scientists studying sex pheromones in animals other than snakes? And is any of that work useful to you or are snakes just entirely different? Yeah. Um, so there's lots of work that's been, that predates, you know, uh, snake pheromone stuff for, you know, centuries actually. Um, They've been obviously studying this a lot in insects for a very long time, mm -hmm. and that's where a lot of the techniques have been worked out. So we basically learn the insect techniques and learn how to apply them to, you know, this weird system that when you work with snakes. Um, for example, it took Bob Mason something like, I don't know, 10 years just to take the isolated pheromone and identify what was there. That's how difficult it was. So um, there's lots of evidence that tons of mammals have specific compounds that act as pheromones. So yeah, it's very broad, it's very broad, uh, widespread. Um, and what's really cool about that is that pheromone communication is arguably the oldest form of communication on the planet, that that's actually the first thing that living, that cells were able to do um, to coordinate multicellularity. So, oh, cool. and there was a second question. I don't. Yep. Here it comes. Uh, this one's from Ellen also. It, she asks, do snakes have any um, defense mechanism during mating season since they don't seem to register threats? Absolutely. <laughs> Anybody that's ever worked, uh, held a water snake, you know this for sure. Um, snakes are really awesome at making some pretty nasty musk um, that they will secrete regardless. Um, and that's not necessarily what I meant by a suppressed stress response. I mean the physiological stress response, which means that their stress hormones will don't go up during the breeding season, but they will absolutely show defensive behaviors. And there's a really cool paper that Pat Gregory did where he showed that as snakes warm or cool, they will phenotypically transition from one type of defensive behavior, which is coiling and flattening the body and flaring the mouth if they're cold trying to make themselves look as threatening as possible, but because they're slow, they're ectotherms when they're cold, right? It's just like, I can't move fast enough to strike you. It's a bluff. And then their strategy completely changes whenever they've warmed up and they'll actually avoid puffing up and will end up striking instead. So it's really, really neat. Um, yeah. Oh, neat. Okay. Um, well, I'm gonna ask all of you this one last question that someone asked our last set of panelists. That was uh, a fun way to end and you can each answer can go in the order that you spoke. Do you dream of snakes? <laughs> I've had a few dreams about snakes and lizards, yes. Okay, Ari? <laughs> oh, many, 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 many uh, amphibian and reptile dreams, certainly so, definitely. Rocky? 
Yeah, I um I dream about uh venomous snakes uh showing up in the yard that I grew up in. <laughs> and I kind of walk through the yard and then I start noticing all of the venomous snakes that are there. So you see one and you see the search image and then all of a sudden the other ones appear as well. And so I don't know what that means. If there's a psychologist listening, call me, you know? Yeah. But, yeah. Tell us all. We all want to know. Um, okay. Well, hopefully, or I'm sure you just made a lot of viewers um, potentially dream of snakes also. So thank you all so much again for being here. It was super fascinating. And uh, viewers, we have one more panel to round out our Snake Patrick's Day programming. It is at 5.30 p.m. Pacific. Sidewinder Secrets, Madagascar's Snake of Palooza, and Flying Snake Brains. So we will see you all then. And thank you to the three of you again. Everyone take care. Bye-bye. Thank Bye, you. Thanks. Bye, thanks.